Good afternoon and welcome to today's serious information security seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Jeremy Rasmussen. Mr. Rasmussen is the manager of information security solutions for Cypress Electronics. Mr. Rasmussen has worked at a number of large engineering and defense industry companies and is currently the uh, manager of, uh, of their information ser security solutions at Cypress, who specializes in vulnerability assessments, pen testing, policy and procedure development, and security training. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen is also an adjunct faculty member at the University of South Florida. Please welcome me, Mr. Rasmussen. Thank you. So today's talk is the best defense is information. Kind of lifted this from a guy named H.D. Moore who runs the Metasploit project because um, the idea is going to be the more information you have in dealing with a, say, a security breach or in being able, being able to prevent against one, the better off you're going to be. And we don't necessarily have all of the infrastructure in place for doing that at this time, but it's something that I know a lot of people are working on. So there's us, um, Cypress Electronics. We've been um, in business for about you know 40 or more years doing some little black boxes for the government that do secure communications and so forth. And then out of that background of information assurance, we built up a security consulting uh, group, which, as Joel said, does some uh, pen testing as well as automating tools uh, to scripts and applications and so forth to help us do what we do better in a more efficient and accurate manner. And so we've done things every, you know, little tactical system in the back of a Humvee, you can the rack of Cisco routers and, and Windows servers that run in the back of a shelter in a Humvee, all the way up to you know, a 350,000 user wide area network across all 54 states and territories. So um, we've had some experience getting our hands dirty doing a lot of different types of systems. One of the things we're really trying to find our niche in is uh, the Presidential Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, or CNCI. As you can see there, the, um, the main thrusts of that are to establish front lines of defense capabilities for our federal enterprise. So making sure there's not a million ways in and out, but, but more controlled in, ingress and egress to the federal enterprise network, depending against a full spectrum of different cyber threats. Coming, ahead, coming up with new leap ahead technologies to shape research and education, defining the, the technologies that are going to help better protect our nation's infrastructure, and then developing tools to enable this all to happen. Um, so to the tune of, what, what we understand is about 17 or 18 billion dollars are being allocated to this in the federal government. So this is certainly an area of, um, for research and development and for companies to get involved and really start moving into some new areas. <clears throat> um, so there's me. Um, uh, as Joel already said, I have a background in software and systems engineering um, and uh, computer science background in um, engineering management, and I teach some classes in cryptography and network security, digital forensics, and hacking. Um, and then I started a group a few years ago called the White Hatters. You might check out our, our website there. It's an organization at the University of South Florida that is there to really learn more about computer security and to participate in organized capture the flag events. Um, you might be wondering about that picture there. Um, so I had an opportunity a year or so ago to be on Jeopardy, and you know, they actually had a makeup person that came and, and dressed you up and everything. Here, you know, you guys are on this strict budget. I, don't, I know I don't look as good as I do. And, um, but I actually had a chance, you know, after the first commercial break when Alex comes over and talks to you about, you know, hey, you have to come up with some anecdote about something. Um, they asked me about um, something, and I said, you know, I, I, the, the thing I talked about was capture the flag. So I have a little clip here that, that shows that and actually shows you a little bit more, too. Welcome back. Jerry Rasmussen is from Lutz, Florida. Good news for you. Well, good news of a sort, I suppose. Our researchers did some checking on uh, your response of hooves a little while ago in that awful French food <laughs> category. And by golly, there are some recipes which use the actual yeah, hooves. Yes, yes it's delicious. Uh, <laughs> so you're getting 1600 bucks, and I'm not sure I ever want to go out to dinner with you. <laughs> However, tell me about something else. You competed in a world championship in hacking. Are you a horse rider? <laughs> Not that type of hacking, Alex. Oh, what? Uh, we have a group. We're computer security experts, and we got together a group at the University of South Florida, and we uh, do 
organized capture the flag events where you have vulnerable systems and you try to get their flags and you try to protect your flag from them. So the largest uh, contest in the world is DEF CON out, out at Las Vegas every year and our goal is to be the best in the world someday at that. We're not the best in the world right now? Well, our team isn't yet, but oh, somebody is. I hope an American team is the best in the world so, I to I think the reigning us. champions are American. Okay, yes. well that's good news. Low Cutting to the end. The best part in my opinion. Pro football, and I was playing against two women. Gene uh, McGuire, like... we start with you. Your response, who are the Dallas Cowboys? Sorry, incorrect. 7,000, you risked everything, so that drops you down to zero. Let's go to Julie now, our champion. She's won uh, $73,000 prior today. She picked the Cowboys also, and that will cost her how much? Oh, hello, nothing. <laughs> so you remain at an even 14,000, so it's up to Jeremy to be correct. <laughs> Is he? He picked the Buffalo Bills. Were you thinking of Buffalo Bill Cody? Yes, I was. You were? Well, good for you, because that's right. How much did you risk? 9801. Hello. Big win. $28,001. You're the champ. You get to come back next week. Enjoy the weekend. You too, folks. Take care. So long. All right. So anyways, I got to mention Capture the Flag on national TV. So that was, you know, my 15 minutes of fame. Um, if you've never played Capture Flag, yes, ma'am. Won on Jeopardy? So I won that day and then I lost the next day. So um, a total of about thirty, thirty-one thousand dollars. So it was Congratulations. Fun. <laughs> Thank you. It was great until the tax bill came due. You know, that was <laughs> and it was really bad. So Capture the Flag is this uh, multi-sided contest where a number of teams compete individually against each other. A, a popular way to do it is Basically, every system, is, every team is given uh, an image of a vulnerable system. By vulnerable, I mean it's like Linux or something, and it has a bunch of intentionally broken services that have vulnerabilities on them. So you have to figure out what those are, fix them, patch them on your on your system so that nobody else can exploit them, and then actively go out and exploit those on everybody else's servers. And that's how you capture. That's how you gain points. So flag is essentially a um, like a base 64 encoded string or something or some kind of hash. And by exploiting the service, you're able to, to read this uh, that you would not otherwise be able to get. And then you um, submit it to some scoring server. So as I mentioned there, the, like the coolest one, the, be the biggest one every year is this uh, um, Def, DEF CON capture the flag out in Vegas. And I just have a little quote from a guy's blog. His name's Atlas, who they won two years in a row, 2006 and seven. He says, from the moment I walked into this access controlled room, I felt like I was playing, like I was walking to a high intensity Playground slash dance club, dim lights, techno thrash music, black green color scheme, the blue siren, all contributed to the feeling of greatness. So this doesn't sound like, you know, what we're used to in the <laughs> academic environment here, right? Stayed uh, in the back of a lab t typing away on some computer. Um, they typically, uh, they purposely make capture the flag. Um, they try to put diversions in there, things to distract you to make it even harder. It's diabolical enough already, but um, it's interesting that um, Atlas and his crew won a couple of years in a row, but they got absolutely clobbered last year by another group, which is um, the School of Root, um, and a guy by the name of Chris Eagle and, and his friends out at the um, Naval Postgraduate School at Monterey. They actually have a really good team out there, and it says, um, this is Atlas writing. He says, we used some technical prowess last year to keep School of Root from getting credit for a lot of points over periods of several hours. So they figured out a way to block their flag submission. This year, School b both multiplied the evil as well as the technical awe of our attack from last year, instead denying any of the teams the ability to score. How they did this, I still can't say specifically, but let's just say they pwned the services themselves and made their own version of a service root kit, modifying information to either prevent us from gaining a shell on, the, on any box or changing the contents of keys so that we receive bogus keys as well as overwrites, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they hacked the scoring system itself. It reminds me of like in Star Trek when Kirk uh, hacked the Kobayashi Maru so he could pass. He was the only one that ever did that. So we're not thinking about, I mean, we're thinking of, you know, genius level people here that have amazing computer security skills. Um, our team's done pretty well actually since we b began three or four years ago. Um, we took first at the amateur CTF before we got to the big one. And um, I don't know if I've talked to a few forensics prof professors this week that um, are familiar with this, um, 
the Defense Cybersecurity Services has a forensics challenge every year, and our team actually took first place for academic teams in that. It's, it's, it's really an interesting challenge. They send you this envelope full of broken disks that have been cut up and stuff, and you have to try to piece them back together and get data off of them. And they give you some other stuff that's like um, some image files, and you have to determine if there's any steganography in them, you know, steg files, and pull those, pull that out. And, and they give you some other files, and you have to determine if they're real versus CG. You know, there's a lot of, and, and they give you a bunch of keys to crack and all this stuff. So we did pretty well one year, but that thing is getting incrementally harder, incrementally harder every single year. But um, my encouragement to you is, you know, they have these university-sponsored events. Um, UC Santa Barbara does one every year. Um, the Cypher Two in uh, the Technical University of Aachen, Germany, does um, a Cypher competition every year, and of course the big, the granddaddy at um, DEF CON every year. And I encourage you. This is really a way to um, learn a ton of stuff in a relatively short time. Um, but you can't just learn at the event. What it does is it spurs you on to go self-study and, and learn even more. Um, you need a lot of screen time, as they say, to, um, to get better, just like with any endeavor, um, mountain climbing, mixed martial arts, card counting, whatever you're, you want to be good at. Um, but I find that the best people, the people who are best at it, really have a solid foundation of computer science, computer engineering. They understand computer organization architecture, how stacks work and how variables work and um, they understand programming languages and they understand you know networking, databases, web and, and um, you know as I said before the best defense is information. This is going to make you better at what you do. Well recently in the news you might have heard about um, an unpatched vulnerability in a well-known PDF viewer. Okay, <laughs> without naming any names. Um, on February 19th, Shadow Server confirmed that there was an exploit for this. Um, uh, I'm here to tell you that it may have been out there a long time before that. It's a very big deal. Um, it actually allows, you know, remote execution, basically arbitrary code execution. Um, this happens across several versions of the software and several different operating systems as well. So it's a cross-platform attack. And guess what? Even though the um, vendor finally um, issued an advisory after it had already gone public, there's no patch for it, and there's probably not going to be one until March 18th. Um, fortunately, our folks, our friends over at Sourcefire, the Snort people, wrote some Snort rules to try to pick it up through an intrusion detection system, and they hacked together a homebrewed patch for it. Um, the Acrobat 32 DLL, oh, I've already I've given away the names now, sorry. Um, they figured out how to um, just basically hack that up. And it's funny because, you know, that's, that's somebody else's code, but they have it up there as a patch. But I'm guessing that the people that haven't put out the patch yet are probably embarrassed, and so they're letting that code stay up there for a while. I know that you guys are aware of it because I, <laughs> I saw on somebody's blog, their serious blog, that they, hit, they had already blogged that they're, when they when they finally did issue the advisory for that, there was no there's not even a CVE associated with that attack yet. So um, CVE is a common vulnerabilities and expo exposure um, value, which means you know a number that's assigned for tracking this particular exploit across any tools that wish to use it. All right. So um, interestingly, we found um, a real version uh, a, a version of this at a real world client some time ago um, I'm not saying it's the exact one described in in that uh, advisory on source fire or at the other place but um, certainly related and um, what happens is it's, it was a targeted attack at a particular victim um, it's PDF attachment the person opens the PDF and it executes some malware it's a dropper it drops in a Trojan then the Trojan does some other things um, we've actually found a, a sample of, the, of a PDF that looked like it contained some incriminating strings in it. Uh, the w first string there shows you that we knew you know, that this thing uses JavaScript. If I didn't mention it already, JavaScript is enabled by default in this tool. It's something you should really think about going and turning off right now. If you have your laptops up and running, go in and set, go into the um, edit, preferences, JavaScript, off. And then we also saw this other indicator, this creator thing that says that, that we know this is a, a device driver creator um, and a toolkit for creating PDF exploits. So this is another indication that, that this thing had been hacked up. 
So like I said, JavaScript's on by default. If you were to load a PDF with a JBIG2 image stream, anybody know what JBIG2 is? It's a compression format for, for black and white files, basically. There, it works in a couple of ways. There's a fast mode where it looks in a static, alloc a static lookup table, and, and the compression's not as good. Um, but then there's another way it runs, and um, it builds a compression table on the fly, and the compression's better. Um, but it basically takes advantage of a buffer overflow, or actually a heap, a heap overflow. So what happens if you go to the fifth byte of that stream, which is your segment header file, and then you go down to the sixth bit, and you can see that that's set. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then those next four bytes read as 0, 0, and then a bunch of threes. Then it would load the following code um, into the DLL. And by s selecting the offset in a particular manner, um, either much, much smaller or much larger than this, you can crash in different areas that are aligned along a 32-bit or, or long, word, long word boundary. If you can do that, then you can essentially point to your, to your shell code. Um, if you were to do a quick heap spray with this using JavaScript, then you could um, reliably write an exploit across that would work in Windows, Linux, um, Mac OS, and it does actually, people have shown proof of concepts where it ha crashes on all three in any any version of the program. Um, I mentioned a heap spray. Heap spray. What is that? Well, it is um, basically introduced a few years ago by a guy named Skyline, and um, he showed it working on Internet Explorer vulnerabil vulnerabilities. Excuse me. So it's generally the um, the term for any code that attempts to put a sequence of bytes at some predetermined location in a target by allocating large blocks of memory and then filling those up with your shellcode. So you can land a heap spray when the vulnerable program does a, a jump or a call into an invalid memory location. Of course, there's a couple of locations, um, a couple of limitations here. The range has to be, um, it can't just be uh, in, in it has to be within the possible heap range for the process. It can't be anywhere in the DLL virtual address space or in somewhere in the process environment block. It has to be within the uh, heap range address space. And it can't be higher than um, 7 FFFF because that's, um, then you're running in kernel address space and you'll get a, you know, a seg fault and nothing will happen. But to land the heap spray in, in, in your browser or in this case in the, this PDF reader that shall remain unnamed, use um, use JavaScript, and then you spray the heap by creating a large Unicode string with a particular repeated uh, sequence of characters. So the way I've seen it done is you start with a string of one character. You concatenate itself to, its, uh, to itself over and over. The length of the str string starts growing exponentially up to the maximum length allowed by your scripting engine. Then when the desired string length is reached, you attach your shell code at the end of the string. And then the heap spring makes copies of, of the long string in the shell code and stores those up in array up to the point where there's enough memory has been sprayed to cover um, anywhere that the um, exploit targets. Jeremy? Yes, sir. So something like NoScript, you can selectively turn off JavaScript for certain websites. Does that get defeated by this? Because you're, once you've downloaded this file, you're now, you're not running a script on that, from that site, right? Um, Okay, are you asking for uh, for the for the Acrobat Reader program or for your Internet Explorer or what? What for the browser? Okay, so for the browser, yeah, it's really it's really a hard choice to turn off JavaScript in your browser because you're gonna you're gonna break functionality on on most any site you go to, but um, maybe set it to prompt, you know, and then you decide whether or not you want to go on. I can't find I can't think of a good reason not to turn it off in Acrobat, however. So um, in this case, if this thing loads up in Acrobat, you'll just, it'll just crash the program and nothing bad will happen. So um, that's a good question. Um, you know, and, and um, the, the professor there, Pascal, I believe, who was blogging about that, was that, that was some of the comments to that is like, have, haven't, we, haven't we had enough JavaScript <laughs> overflow errors? And um, you know, I don't know what the answer is to that in terms of your browser. Um, you try turning it off. Try turning off cookies sometimes and see what happens. 
it's very hard to navigate and, and you're going to drive yourself crazy if you do this cancel or allow type thing. So, um, but, but where we can turn it off definitely is in your, is in your Acrobat reader. All right, so this particular um, bug that we found looks like it fills up the heap with the shell code and then passes an overly long buffer to this um, JBIG2 decode function. The way it behaves is it uh, reads the re remainder of the file, writes a file marker, drops your dropper onto the disk, calls the program and executes it, and then cleans itself up and exits. Very tidy. I'd like to say that we were, you know, super, super sleuths and found this ourselves, but actually um, with a zero day attack like that and, and never having seen it in the wild before, um, we actually had help. Um, the client um, had a development partner who had actually been hit by the same thing previously and had some intel on it and was actually actively monitoring some command and control sites that the malware tried to beacon out to and saw this client's, one of this client's IP address IP address is going out to the command and control site. So um, they, they called the client, and then the client was able to sign an NDA and, and uh, just get some information. So what I'd like to do now is kind of walk you through some of the forensic steps we took when we, heard, when we first heard about this thing, of what we did um, to work through it, to discover the extent of the damage, if you will, how to put into effect rules that would stop it maybe next time, and then um, you know, lessons learned from there. All right, so we got this call from the third party. Or actually, they got the call from the third party who said, hey, we're seeing this thing beacon out. So they, they didn't really have an incident response plan, this client, and so they put together this ad hoc team that said, we've we got to come up with some course of action here now that we know we've been hit. So they contacted us, and by the next way, on the next day, we were there on site helping them to do the forensic analysis. So the next day, they signed this NDA, of course, and um, were able to get their log with specifics about the about a particular machine. Um, talking about that machine turned out to be a Windows 2000 box. Oh no, right? I can't believe you know, couldn't believe somebody was using that first of all. But then um, turned out the job of that box was to like monitor maintenance and alarms, lights, temperature, humidity controls, and so forth. And so it had it, it was it was purposely given a remote control capability so that the alarm company could interface with it. Um, so turned out the, the compromised account turned out to be a, a desktop management application. Um, that's, this is bad because this desktop management application enforces policy everywhere in the environment, in the enterprise, which means it has domain admi admin privileges. So, uh oh, now that, you know, we realize these guys have the keys to the kingdom. So we told them, um, change the password immediately for that service level account. And um, they did that. Of course, it broke the desktop <laughs> application. It took them a few days to fix that. Um, should I even mention this? Yeah, I'll mention it. The, no, I, I shouldn't. Oh, it's so bad. The password was so weak. I shouldn't say. Yeah, the password was password with an exclamation, though, um, in a capital P. OK, so it met all their, their, their minimal standard of, of requirements. It was eight characters long. It had a mixture of upper and lower case. It had punctuation in there. Hey, we're good to go. Um, but as you can imagine, I stuck that thing in Jack the Ripper. I'm sorry, John the Ripper cracker, and had it in about 20 minutes. So um, if I had, I probably could have guessed it quicker myself. You know, before that, we pulled the uh, hard drives off the suspect machine. Did a bitstream copy using a, a Linux live CD in the DD command. Um, just simple way, simple cheap way to do an image. You know. Um, if you do, if you try to do file copies, you're going to miss stuff because uh, you really need to do a bit a bit stream copy. Then, because uh, you don't you don't want to tamper with the original evidence because you might be messing up, you know, the, the evidence itself. So you want to always use a copy. So then, from the log analysis, we were able to identify some other serv servers that had potentially been accessed. We copied all the hard drives, imaged them, and, and that took until like 11:30 at night. So it was definitely a long first day. Second day. Um, we had them kick off some older, um, or we kicked them off, automated vulnerability scans across all the servers, and especially servers in the DMZ or any that had remote access capability, just to see if, if we're missing anything here. We wrote a script to search for all the um, file string, file name strings that were associated with this particular malware, and um, we um, 
looked on every machine for a particular service that we knew from, from the logs was associated with the malware. This is a bad time. We, when we were out there looking around for things, we found a cache of files called temp.temp, .temp, a large cache, 94 megabytes in size. And it contained, as you can see there, it's, I've changed all the names of these files, but essentially you get the gist, is it um, advanced products, board of directors, corporate restructuring plan, economic financial forecast, basically all the, all the company jewels. Um, and, and also a little program called temp.exe, which was actually the RAR archiving program, um, was, was stuck in there. So um, this kind of showed us that yeah, the horse had bolted the barn. Um, we gave the results of our vulnerability scans over the IT staff to start remediating them. It turns out they were actually missing some older um, Acrobat patches. So, um, you know, we're talking about this zero day. They, they didn't even have the old stuff covered. Um, the alarm company came out and installed a new server for the uh, environmental controls. We made sure they VLANed it off to its own, uh, its own isolated part of the network. And we started to do some reverse engineering of the malware. Um, there's a program called Ida Pro. Uh, I should I should have mentioned this when I was talking about the CTF stuff. C T Capture the flag has really gone far into the difficult and ethereal stuff lately. With with um, basically what they'll do is the, one of your vulnerable services, or at least or some of them, will be um, binaries that are compiled with no debug symbols, and you have no idea what they're supposed to do. So you have to use a tool such as Ida Pro to try to reverse engineer this, this uh, malware or, or vulnerable service, figure out what it's trying to do and how to, how to collect flags from it. So we use the same approach here. Of course, when I started up the thing, I immediately found that the code had used some um, obfuscation techniques because I got these um, subprogram analysis failed errors. If you've ever looked at Ida Pro, it kind of look, it looks like this, where um, they give you a, a layout of the overall you know, flow of the code and then you can click on any one of these things and it will bring up the assembly code um, and as best as it can. Now in this case, like I said, what we found is that it was probably packed because um, I didn't see any IP. We knew, we knew that there was particular IP address things this thing was beaconing out to, but we didn't, couldn't see those in the binary. So, But I, something I did see in the binary was just, just doing a strings on the binary. I could find some Mozilla headers, so I knew that was probably being used to disguise as traffic. So this thing is just using port 80, right? Looking like a regular web user. Um, figured the exploit was probably written in assembly because the strings were referenced in line, not in the data section. If you know how code's laid out, this was an you know, interesting case. Um, with all the code and data in intermingling, I knew we were going to have to do some deobfuscation. So, what I really want to do is figure out how this thing works. If it does anything besides go out to this command and control site, like does it try to spread itself and maybe how to come up with a signature to stop it. <clears throat> so while we were, while we were continuing the, um, the reversing activities, we also just did, okay, let's fire this thing up in a, in, a, in a clean install of a PC and see how it works. And we saw that these, um, these executables and DLLs um, we're running, uh, we ran like regmon, procmon, filemon to see exactly what was happening. Uh, like I said, it definitely, it, op it opened a, re a hidden process of Internet Explorer. It looked like a, um, it was configurable to beacon out at, at various times. And then um, just sticking a sniffer on the machine, we could tell that it was trying to get out to certain ports over port 80 and certain um, websites. Um, and I just erased those there just because, because of the NDA, I can't disclose those. Um, after, the, after coming up with this information, we finally got the sysadmin to write some rules to block the ingress and egress on those sites. You know, bless, these heart, bless the hearts of these guys. They're overworked. They've got so much to do. Security is just another hat they have to wear. And so, um, you know, it took like, at least two days before they finally got some, um, I mean, we told them this is, this is probably the first thing we want to do is write some rules to block this stuff. But, so it took them two days to get those rules written to, for the firewall. All right, so not much happened on sat um, Saturday. That was our day off, and then, except about in the middle of the night, um, I was, I don't know what I was doing up at 1 o'clock on a s Sunday morning, but um, one of the sysadmins got an alert that um, after setting up these rules that somebody was trying to beacon out on one of the known URLs, and it was trying to copy data from a shared file server. 
So he IM'd me. We discussed a plan of action. Basically, he sent a shutdown command to kill that PC and remove the user's smart card from their physical access control system just to make sure that when the guy came in on Monday, IT could get to his box before he got to it. The guy wasn't very happy, by the way. <laughs> he got to the work first on Monday and couldn't get into the building and wasn't sure what was going on or if he still had a job. So anyway, um, that got taken care of. Um, this guy's box, it looked like it was a different service level account than the other one. This was the backup server, okay? Another domain admin credentialed account. All right, so immediately we, we changed the credentials on that one. So on Monday we pulled that guy's PC uh, and looked at the image suspect drive. Um, we imaged the suspect drive and started doing some forensic analysis on that. Had another follow-up meeting with this third party. Um, fortunately, the last connections they saw to the suspect machines were on Friday, because right, we started putting the rules in, blocked everything, nothing could egress. So firewall rules are working now. And finally, the sysadmin got around to pushing out those Adobe updates that we had told them about two or three days earlier. So um, there you have it. We did a script. We kicked off a script that would scan their entire Class B for known signatures of, that associated with the malware. Found no additional infected boxes. The only signature we found was on, on this file server, which we already knew. We left, we left something there, particularly to make sure our script was running right so it would tell us that it was there. All right, just a little bit more we figured out after reversing the, the malware is that um, it, uh, let's see, it looks like it does mostly gets, you know, it, there's a per curious lack of puts. So we're trying to think about exactly how this thing works. Okay, so if, it, if it's a get, it's getting like the login page, but you have to do a put in order, if, like, if, you're, if you're doing a user ID and password to log in. So uh, we continue to puzzle about that, but um, I don't know if I've ever gotten to the bottom of that or not. Uh, there was an attempt, the, the code attempts to delete itself. Um, maybe we were able to stop it. Basically, um, let's see. Yeah, the, the EXE uh, launched an Air Explorer, got a handle to it, created a thread in the load library with the stack containing the DLL, then it tried to delete itself but you can't, once you've mapped, I mean, once you've linked to a file, you can't delete that file while you're still running. So we must have gotten to it before it was able to delete itself. That's why we still have this specimen. So we figured to make, to keep this thing from being infective, make sure that all these machines are only using non-admin accounts. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, and then deny debug rights to all the accounts. Okay. And then we also found out the malware had the path to Internet Explorer hard-coded, so maybe if we just move the binary around, it would break the break future versions of this um, malware. The malware also did a few other things. It looked for cached passwords. Um, you know, whenever you try to lo log into a server, you locally cache your password. You can turn that off with one quick little security setting at, at your in your local security policy. But, no, you know, by default it's turned on. And this, the third party that we were speaking to was saying that they think that those, those attackers have a really strong cracking capability. So, you know, no doubt as soon as they were able to get the cached um, passwords for the, the local, uh, for the admin accounts, domain admin accounts, they were able to break those very quickly. It also goes out and looks for un other unpatched systems on the network. And it create, tries to create a guest user for, for later, for backdoor at a later time. All right, so the question is, what can we do to create signatures for this thing? Well, the answer is not that much because um, if, you, if you try to say, okay, well, I'm going to look for a particular string of files or registry entries, all I'm going to do is find an already infected system, so it's not going to help me prevent against future attacks. And also, you have to imagine that this malware is going to polymorph over time, so they're not going to use the exact same names for temp files, right? They're going to change those every, every time they they fit, spread the infection. So signatures, not so much. Probably looking to other areas. Uh, question is, where did this thing come from? Um, this is still open for speculation, but I have a theory on that. Um, I found a thing called ghost, which is a rat. Depending on whom you, you ask, a rat is either a remote administration tool or a remote access trojan. Okay, and um, I found variants of this, uh, this rat, this uh, ghost toolkit have some very nice features such as encrypted communications, a command parser for doing command and control and so forth. 
Um, this thing was a basic client server model. You might think that that's really passe. Like today's, excuse me, today's botnets are, are mostly like peer to peer, right? You don't have this command hierarchy of a client and a server. But you know what? Here, here's this thing still working just fine, <laughs> stealthily, and nobody noticing it. Um, it. You know, it wasn't the pinnacle of sophistication, but something it did do is it it, it encrypted its communications. Um, we knew we couldn't break its its AES encryption, 128-bit encryption, but we could black box it. I mean, we had a copy of the of the executable, so we could just force feed it commands and then watch the output. So that's what we did. Um, we opened a, a session config file. We um, initialized the crypto API, which is what uh, does the AES encryption. Created a hash uh, of a known password, which again got from this third party. They're pretty smart, and they'd have been looking at this thing for a long time. And then we just use the hash to create a session key and decrypt the final contents. So that way we, be, we were able to see everything this thing did. List drives, copy files, exec, you know, if external exec calls. And every time it, it did something right, it would say, I'm happy. And every time it failed, it would be like, I'm sad. So, all right, so what do we tell these people? Well, make them feel good. Hey, everybody's at risk for a zero day. Um, but how you approach it. What, how prepared you're going to be, and how much damage it, it, you're going to limit, it, you know, in your in your approach is another matter. So we said they really needed to have a whole framework of security, in depth prevention, detection, reaction. For one thing, they needed an incident response plan. What are you going to do if something happens? Who's going to be responsible? What is it, you know, the timetable for action? Who does what? Second thing is obviously. This one I thought we'd figure everybody would know anyway, anyway but for your domain admin accounts, um, put a very, very strong and hard to guess password on there. Um, they had some, some commercial standard for their, for their core desktop configuration, but you can go a little bit better. You can lock that thing down a lot, a lot more. There's some, um, there's the DOD publishes some guidance called the Security Technical Implementation Guides or STIGs. That's a really good um, set of guidance standards for, for locking down systems, operating systems, databases, web, and so forth. They were definitely behind on their patching, but, but more importantly, they had no comprehensive vulnerability management process. So anytime a new, they, they, didn't, ha they didn't have anybody constantly monitoring for security vulnerabilities. So when one came out, they didn't, you know, they didn't have somebody going and downloading it, testing it out on a, on a, on, in a sandbox, and then pushing it out to their environment. It just wasn't happening in a timely manner. For that matter, there was no awareness or education training. There was some initially when the people come into the organization, they had to go through some in, some training to get an account, but there wasn't any periodic re-education, you know, hey, don't click on those unknown attachments, that type of thing. Um, and the other thing I mentioned is they didn't really have a, de a dedicated security resource. So this was just a one of many duties that their IT admins had to do, which is really a conflict of interest if you think about it. Your security person is supposed to be sort of doing checks and balances on what the people doing the configuration are doing. It can't be the same person doing both. So um, they had some of their external con connections were were forced through the DMZ, but others were not. Um, so we advised them, you know, hey, this is really this is really dangerous in, in the case of this alarm box. Um, you want to you want to definitely isolate that thing, put it out on its own VLAN. They had no host-based IDS. Host-based IDS is what maybe maybe um, Tripwire or some sort of tool like that would, you know, you hash all your important system files, and then on a periodic basis you go back through and you rehash them and compare those against um, what's stored in a database. And if there's a change, then you know somebody's dropping rootkits on you. So they had no, no, none of that capability. They had, um, <coughs> I, like I said before, blocking mobile code or you know, you're going to get everybody screaming if you say turn off all JavaScript. But at least push out something to turn off JavaScript in your in your uh, Acrobat. They had had a comprehensive IA vulnerability assessment probably about four or five years ago, but <laughs> that's a little bit long. So maybe um, we advised them they they needed to, needed to do that on maybe an annual basis or at least every couple of years. Another thing that really impeded our investigation is they didn't have much in the way of audit logs. The audit logs got overwritten every two weeks. So we're sitting here trying to go down the rabbit hole with this thing, and the data, you know, we didn't have enough data to go on to see. We, couldn't, we could not definitively say 
how much of what type of data went out the door, right, because we had no logs. We could have possibly recreated those from their backup tapes, the backup archives, with a lot of difficulty. But um, in general, we advise them with um, some ways to run some scripts and go and grab those on a periodic basis and then store them off and, you know, before you overwrite them. And then, of course, just grabbing the audit data doesn't do anything if nobody looks at it. They needed to have some tools in place so somebody could parse through those and make sense of them and see if something malicious was happening. Because, to be honest, if they saw that um, the temp.temp, .temp, you know, 100 meg file going out containing all kinds of vital data to the company and it was going out to some un unknown web website, log review might have been, um, might have been able to pick that up. Back to that issue of disclosure we mentioned a little bit earlier. Here's a question for you. Um, is there really a good reason to disclose a vulnerability to the, you know, to the public if there's no patch and there's no evidence of the exploit in the wild? Uh, you would probably have a hard time convincing me that, of that. But once it's out there, you know, makers of antivirus and, and tools, IA scanners, um, IDS, IPS, really depend on some of that detailed vulnerability data to be able to update their products and create signatures and so forth. So um, you might think, okay, well, antivirus vendors probably have a lot of their own raw data that they collect anyway. That's probably true. But I bet a lot of them go to places like Millworm, which has, you know, exploit code and um, bug track and full disclosure and um, places like that in order to get the latest and greatest information so they can update these tools and make everybody safer. The bad guys already have the information, right? It's the good guys that don't have it if you're, if you're not disclosing. So at this point, you know, I, get, I think the best strategy for us as, a, as the information assurance community is to really raise awareness about the, the vulnerabilities that are out there, try to get everybody as much relevant information as possible, and apply pressure on those vendors to get patches out quicker. How does this all fit back into the CNCI that we mentioned earlier? Well, there's a couple, there's a few places. Like one, expanding education, you know, might might be a place where you could say, don't um, don't click on that attachment. And and they're talking about not at just education at the university level, they're saying, and, or a professional level, but all the way like K through 12, um, teaching kids at an early age about cybersecurity. Another area is these uh, leap ahead technologies. I'm um, coming up with new ways to to find zero-day attacks, uh, anomalous behavior detection. Not just look for signatures, but look for bad behavior. Um, you know, a, a program that tries to do a delete star dot star on your file system, probably not a good, not, a, not an allowable behavior, right? So things like that, you're trying, to, you're trying to look for something. Maybe you haven't seen a signature of it before, but you know that you should block that bad behavior. And then another area is this one right here. You know, if we had a really good way to get together and connect and share cyber threat information, of course, minus attribution. We don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, I think we could um, be on top of these things a lot quicker. We know that this third party, who was a partner with this other company, had known about this particular attack for a long time, several months. And had they had been, been able to share this information earlier, if there was some kind of consortium or something that they're in, they, um, would have, this company would have been able to put the protections in place to have avoided the whole attack. So some final thoughts here. I say the best defense is information. Um, like I said, knowledge of this attack had been known for a long time before our tar tar um, client was targeted. The under underground is really good at sharing information. But we're not. The white hat community, you know, information assurance practitioners are not. Why is that? So we really need this system. Um, InfraGuard is a good start. That's a, an FBI and industry cooperation, cooperative um, engagement where we're trying to get together and share data, but we need to take InfraGuard a step further. We really need to have some kind of um, maybe nationalized database where you can authenticate to this thing and you can share threat and vulnerability data in a timely manner so it can get out to the people that need to have it and, uh, and they can update their systems accordingly. All right, there you go, a real world example, and hopefully we'll, you'll, you'll help us as future security practitioners be able to implement this and, and bring it to fruition. Any questions? Jeremy, you may want to mention that uh, there are potential employment opportunities, whether now or in the future with you guys. Absolutely. So, um, talked about Cypress Electronics. We're down in Tampa, Florida. Sunny Tampa, 70 plus degrees down there today. <laughs> 
and um, we have uh, you know we have a, a hardware system software security engineering capability um, for these for these secure communications products and services that we're trying to breed in the government especially in the CNCI areas and uh, we have a large manufacturing and production capability as well so um, if you have desire to work in that area and bring your, your skill sets, your knowledge of computer engineering and computer science, IT, and um, bring it to bear working in some exciting areas and helping shore up our national infrastructure, then we'd love to talk to you. And my director of engineering, Hal's right back there. He'll take, take your resume on the spot. Any other questions? Excuse me? Servers, the command and control server, is that the same one that I think uh, maybe two years back there was some uh, buffer overflow, same Adobe buffer overflow attacks, and the command and control servers were from Russia. Um, so are I'm not the at same liberty guys? to I'm not at liberty to say about the nationality uh, that we think was was behind the attack, but it it did see, it did appear to be a nation state um, trolling for information on on future products and strategy and and company direction. Um, and that was a wide, it was a widespread attack. This was not the only person targeted, but um, I can't say who. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe afterwards you can ask about Jeopardy. Yeah, ask me, ask me about Jeopardy. Everybody always likes to hear about Jeopardy.